invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark as we continue worshiping the Lord. Oftentimes we forget that preaching is worship, both for the man who is preaching and for the hearers. So therefore let us continue in that worship of God as the word of God is preached and as it goes forth and as we hear it. We are in Mark chapter 1, continuing our series through the book of Mark, verse by verse, word for word. We are going to find ourselves this Lord's Day morning in verse 16. I'm going to read verses 16 all the way down to verse 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Mark writes under the inspiration of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. He writes in verse 16. As he, that being Christ, as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father's evening in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. Let us pray. Father, as I stand before your people, as I preach your word, I pray for much unction, much grace, I pray that all which I have studied that needs to be conveyed would be brought to my mind. Father, I ask that the hearers, even my own soul, Lord, that we would be greatly, greatly encouraged, those of us who know Christ. And for those who do not, I pray that the Spirit of God this day would begin a convicting work that perhaps might elapse a very long period, perhaps months or years, that might one day lead to their salvation. If not, it is my prayer that they would, as they hear the gospel preached, that they would be immediately converted and brought to saving faith in Christ. And Father, it is our chiefest prayer that you would be glorified among us and in us. We are so thankful for the Word of God, for the potency of the Word of God and the depth of Scripture. I'm convinced once more every week as I study and I see the Word of God unfold before my eyes and I see the depth of it and I see how the Scriptures search out the man. As a great preacher once said that he has read many books, but the Bible <laughs> reads him. Father, that is so true. And so may the Word of God convict, encourage, Edify, and ultimately, as it goes forth, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in His name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is Calling the First Disciples. Suppose one of us desired to purchase property here in Lawrence County, and then to then go and try and build a large house on the property. What would be one of the first steps we would take? It would, of course, be that we would sit down and calculate the cost. Calculate the material that is needed to build such a house. Calculate how much it would impact our bank account to hire workers to aid us in the process. To calculate even the tax that it would, it would be to do such a thing. And then, of course, we would take upon ourselves that very act and do it. But we must first count the cost. And as you know, brethren, when it comes to following after Christ, one must count the cost. One must count what it might cost them to be a disciple of Christ. In fact, Jesus told a very similar analogy to what I myself just told. He spoke of a king going out to war against another king in the Gospels. Of course, it was a hypothetical situation. He was using it as a parable to convey this truth. He talks about, of course, a king before he goes to battle sits down and calculates whether or not he can win the battle, whether or not he has a formidable foe to fight, or whether it is something which he cannot do. And he will be utterly obliterated by the enemy. 
Otherwise, he's not going to do that. Instead, he will try and, and establish a peace treaty. Brethren, so is discipleship. And even for you unconverted souls, even you who are lost, this is something you must consider. You must count the cost of following after Jesus Christ. I think about right now, at this very present moment, on the other side of the globe, in the nation of North Korea, where many Christians are in prison camps, many Christians are persecuted for the cross of Christ. Many pastors who have underground churches are being tortured for the sake of the gospel and for the testimony of our Lord. Brethren, that could be you. That could be me. We have to count the cost of following after Christ. We have to consider, sit down and consider what it is we are doing. There is an evangelistic aspect to this that when the gospel is preached, there needs to be a call to radical discipleship. Because there's an interesting dichotomy in salvation. A very interesting dichotomy. Scripture says in one place that salvation is of the free mercy of God. It is of free grace, and that is true. Very much true. In fact, just uh, two days ago, I sat down with two men one of them whom I met as I was open air preaching. They live here in the community. And uh, these men were, both had their Bibles and they were trying to defend salvation by works. They were staunchly for the position that salvation was by works. In fact, the, the man told me, he listed off nine things you must do to be saved. He talks about baptism, repentance, faith, obedience, keeping the commands, and so on and so forth. And it broke my heart, honestly, talking with these men because of the, the, the blindness, the spiritual blindness. But we obviously know that Scripture says salvation is of the free mercy of God. So that's one half of the dichotomy. But the other half is that Scripture also says, and Jesus preached this very, very straightforwardly, is that salvation and being a disciple and being a follower of Christ costs you everything. Costs you everything. It will cost you your life. It will cost you your money. It will cost you all your possessions. It will cost you your relationships. It will cost you your reputation. How can that be? I like to think of it like this, that when someone is saved, when someone is justified, surely that is of the free mercy of God. However, now being saved and now being justified calls for self-death. It calls for self-abasement. And self-forsaking. And when we think about our own lives, and we think about counting the cost, think about, or even you who are lost, perhaps a seeker, perhaps you're a seeker, and you're seeking after the truth. You're seeking after the truth of the Word of God. You're searching for salvation. I encourage you to count the cost. And one of the best places that we can go to in Scripture, one of the best passages that we can consult is the one that we are considering this morning. Here in Mark 1, where Jesus calls the disciples. He calls these four men, the first disciples. In fact, the three of these four men are going to later, as we're, as we're going to see, are going to be a part of this, this very intimate inner circle of Jesus. And as we know from the record of church history, from the early church fathers, that most every one of Jesus' disciples was martyred for the gospel of Christ. They had to count the cost of following after Christ. And so must we. So must we consider our own lives and consider, does Jesus, in my own estimation, is He more valuable and is, is He more worthwhile? To me than anything. And it is my heart's desire. That every person in this place. Their heart would cry. Yes. And not just their heart would cry. But their life and their actions. Would reflect what resonates from their lips. So let us consider. This passage this morning. In its cost. Of discipleship. And how Jesus. After having now begun his ministry, having now preached, calls 
his first disciples. But before we do that, I would like to consider the context of this chapter, or excuse me, of these few verses. In all of Mark 1 here, this is really the beginning. This is, this is the opening to his book and the opening to his record of Jesus' ministry and his life and his teaching. We saw at the beginning uh, concerning John the Baptist's ministry, then the beginning of Jesus' ministry, that it was marked by baptism, marked by his temptation in the wilderness. Then we saw last week in verses 14 and 15 that Jesus' ministry, in terms of his preaching, opened up with this explosive uh, subject matter. In verse 15, Jesus preached, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This glorious gospel preaching. In fact, in verse 14 it says, He was preaching the gospel of God. And we, we saw last week that the gospel of God is, is talking about God's ownership of the gospel, His authorship, and the content of the gospel. And so now Jesus really having made a name for himself in the sense that people knew about this man. They knew about his preaching. He was popular. In fact, we know from uh, Matthew 7 that his preaching, the people saw it as authoritative preaching. And they were astounded. Now in Mark's gospel, we need to understand also that it's only a selection of events. It's not thorough. It's not, a, a, it's not a complete record in the sense that he covers absolutely every event. There is time that elapses between 15 and 16 here, verse 15 and 16. And we'll see why that is a little later on from the other gospel writers, from Luke and from John specifically, in their, in their um, chronicling the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are events that happen between these two verses. So we need to understand that this isn't necessarily... Like Jesus stepped down and was done preaching and then he immediately did this. There were some things that happened in between. But Mark carefully picks every narrative that he puts in this greater narrative. This grander story. Every little event in every story in the greater story he's trying to tell is picked for a specific reason. In fact, I love what John says at the end of his gospel. He says there, there's so many things Jesus uh, did that if they were to be written, the world wouldn't have enough room for the books that would be written. Of course, that's a hyperbole, but he's, he's just speaking of the, 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 grand, uh, the grandeur, the, the great, vast amount of things Jesus did. And so the gospel writers had to be very selective as to what they recorded. But what is written down, we know, has been given to us, not by merely men or by gospel writers, but by the Spirit of God. So as we consider these, these verses here, I would like to see four things. I would like for us, they, they break up quite well. Firstly, we're going to consider the first call, and that is found in verses 16 and 17. Secondly, we're going to see the first response, that's found in verse 18. Thirdly, we're going to see the second call, which is found in verses 19 and 20, the first half of verse 20. And then fourthly, we're going to see the second response, which is found at the last part of verse 20, or the second half of verse 20. So let us, as we, as we look at this text, let us consider those four things. Firstly, the first call, and that's found in verses 16 and 17. So verse 16 begins by saying, as he was going along by the sea of Galilee. Now we'll just stop right there. We know from last week, as I, as I highlighted and as I pointed out in verse 14, that it also speaks of Jesus' entering into the region of Galilee, entering into this area. And this is a densely populated area in northern Israel. We know also that much of Jesus' ministry happened in this region and in this area and around the lake, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, and even, we know some of the mystery even happened on the water itself. I also mentioned last week that the word Galilee is mentioned 57 times in the four Gospels. It, it, it really was the stage that was set for Jesus' ministry. A huge portion of it. So, he's going along by the Sea of Galilee. Also, it's important to note that obviously, and we know this from the text as we read it, but it's important we keep this in mind, that there was a large fishing industry, and even to this day there's fishing 
history that happens there. Uh, but I didn't know this. I was studying uh, last night concerning this text. I didn't know that the Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. It's the, it's the lowest fresh water, uh, or body of fresh water in the world. That's interesting. I didn't know that. But anyway, so Jesus would have been familiar with the fishing industry here in this area and in Galilee. And the, the fishing industry was what employed Simon and Andrew, John and James, the four men we're going to see in this passage. These four men were fishermen. And we'll see later on that in Luke, Jesus actually caused a miracle to happen in terms of their fishing Employment. We'll, we'll see that in a moment. And so we find, then the next phrase says, He saw Simon. We'll stop right there. He saw Simon. Now, who is Simon? We know Simon is Peter. We know that Simon is Peter. Later on in Mark, we know that Mark right, actually says Simon again, and he actually says, he, Jesus called Simon Peter. So he gave him a different name later on. And so this is Peter. This is really, in terms of the, the 12 disciples that are spoken of in, G, in the four Gospels, this is Jesus' his most closest disciple. He was really the, the, the one we see the most data concerning in the New Testament. It was Peter. In fact, one such place I would invite you to turn with me to is Matthew 16. We find one of the, one of the best one of the best things that happened, I would say, in Peter's entire life in Matthew 16. Beginning in verse 13. Matthew 16, 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So in other words, what is the, the people's perception of me? Of course, this is not Jesus trying to obtain new information. He knows. He is trying to solicit a response from his disciples. To get them to, to confess openly, not only what they thought the people thought Jesus was, who, who Jesus was, but even who they, who they themselves saw Jesus to be. So it says in verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he said to them, I don't really like this, but who do you say that I am? Now notice... Up to this point, it's a conversation between Jesus and the disciples, just very generically. It doesn't really say who necessarily was answered. It could have just been they were all together answering. But then listen to this, verse 16. Simon Peter. So we have this, this excited disciple here. He steps in and he just he butts in and says this. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just boldly. Okay, you're Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, and Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Barjona would be uh, son of Jonah, so that would have been his father. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall, be have, shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Christ. So we see here an aspect of Peter's characteristics, that he was really a spokesperson for the disciples. We'll see a little later on in Acts 2 how that, how that fleshed out after the Spirit of God came. So Peter's kind of the ring leader, you could say, of the disciples Christ certainly was their leader, but you can kind of say lower down than that, Peter may have been calling them along as well. You know, guys, all right, let's go. Let's follow Jesus this way. But listen to what verse 21, verses through 23 says. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So even though Peter's the strong leader, this zealous man for the, for the cross of Christ, he's, he's passionate. He's also foolish. 
He has zeal but little knowledge. And in his ignorance, he tries to prevent Christ from accomplishing his chief end. And of course, Jesus strongly rebuked him. And later on, we know from the record of the New Testament that Peter's lack of wisdom and discernment and his immaturity and his ignorance and even pride got him in just pretty bad situations. In fact, later on in Matthew 26, in verse 69, we find an account of Peter's denying Christ. We know that Peter was one of the disciples who boldly and boastfully declared that though all forsake Jesus, what he say? I won't. I'm not going to forsake you, Lord. And of course, Jesus gave the prediction that no, you will forsake me. You will abandon me. You will deny me. That's why in verse 69 it says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean? But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you were talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, an oath I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you two are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. And he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter is strong but weak. He is, he, is a, he is a leader among the disciples, yet he also has great weakness. And we know later what happened. Even though he fell, Jesus restored him. We know that from John, from the end of the book of, of, of the Gospel of John, that Jesus did restore him. He did. He brought him back. And that gives us great hope, even as, as believers, on a side note, that when we fail, when we fall into sin, the grace of God is there. The grace of God is there. God can, will, and He does restore His people. He does. He comes after Christ comes after his sheep. If there's a sheep to stray, he's going to come and bring them back into the fold. And that's even, you know, when we look in our world, we look in our society, specifically here in the South, and we encounter false converts. We encounter people who say they know Christ. Yet they live in blatant sin and, and continual, habitual rebellion to God. And the shepherd doesn't come after them because they're not his sheep. They're not His sheep. If Christ doesn't come after you, when you live in rebellion to God, when you find yourself in disobedience and in habitual sin, if Christ does not come after you and reprimand you and discipline you, it's because you're not His. I can think of in my own life even how when I have fallen into sin in the mercy of God, He's disciplined me. It's, it's amazing to watch, uh, especially really in retrospect, not necessarily at the moment because it's certainly painful, but the, the grace and love of God for His people. He disciplines them. So in Peter's life we see that. Jesus restores him back. He comes and He brings him back. And I wish I could, I wish I could do a whole survey of the life of Peter, because there's so much data in the New Testament concerning Peter. I mean, he wrote two books of the New Testament, first and second Peter. But I just want to look at briefly a couple more places in Acts, in Acts 2, if you turn with me there in Acts 2. I said a minute ago concerning Peter being really the, 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 the ringleader, the spokesman for the apostles. I think that's a good title to give him because we see this flesh out in, in Acts 2. Specifically in Acts 2, we're going to look at verse 14. And I could even, if I had the time, I'd even look at Acts 1, when Peter also speaks up in, in the midst of the, of the disciples who were in the upper room. After Jesus ascended into glory, they were praying, they were, they were waiting for the Spirit of God to come. Peter even there shows his leadership capabilities and qualities. But specifically, this is after the Holy Spirit has come, they're clothed with power from on high. Verse 14 says, But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them. And of course we find one of the best sermons in all of Scripture. One of the most amazing evangelistic sermons in all of Scripture. He says, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, 
for it is only the third hour of the day. Going down to verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of God this man and put him to death. It's interesting. I just want to note, what do we find in, in, in a modern Baptist church or a modern evangelical church? The preacher gets up and he, he calls out the sinners. He says, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Notice apostolic preaching. Notice Peter's preaching. He says, Jesus died because of you. Notice the difference. A lot of evangelistic preaching, what is supposedly called that today, they're quick to say, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. And they really don't know if they're elect or not. But apostolic preaching said, you sinned so greatly, you put the Christ to death. You put the Son of God to death. But then in verse 24, he says, But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. That does not sound like seeker-sensitive preaching. It does not. Look at, look at, listen to verse uh, 36. Just a, a few verses down. He says, that, this is the end of his sermon. Therefore, well, actually, I believe he probably would have continued speaking. But look at what it says. Therefore, in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The finger is pointed straight and saying, You're the sinner. You're the enemy of God. You put Christ on the cross. You're an enemy of God. And then look at verse 37. Who gives the invitation? The sinners give the invitation. The sinners are the ones who are bringing the application. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the sinners break up his sermon and say, what are we going to do? That is powerful preaching. That is heart-searching, soul-piercing preaching. And that's what we need today. That's what we desperately need. But we see a great aspect. We see Peter's character come through there. We see the kind of man Peter was. There are just certain people who are specifically designed by God and built by God for certain purposes. He was a speaker. He was, he was able to speak on behalf of the apostles. It didn't say they put another apostle for order, Andrew or James or John. They put Peter. Peter had ability. He had gift. He had, he had unction from on high. And so, here when we go back to Mark 1.16 and we see the word Simon, we need to keep in mind who Peter was and how greatly God used him. Later on, we know he wrote First and Second Peter, as I mentioned. And as church history tells us, he went on to be, to be crucified for Christ. Crucified for the gospel. But interestingly, he told those who were crucifying him to do it upside down because he wasn't worthy of to die the way Jesus is Lord died. That's powerful. And it all began with a man who was a fisherman. Jesus called men who were not in the, in the objective sense qualified. They were men who were uneducated. We know that from the, from the book of Acts. That the Jewish people were confused by the preaching of the apostles because they said they're uneducated. They're unlearned. They're these poor fishermen from out the Sea of Galilee. These smelly fishermen. You can imagine how bad they would have smelled from their, from, their, from their vocation. And Jesus used them. And we know that from 1 Corinthians. God chooses the least likely of vessels. God uses those who are sometimes so unlikely to be used for such purposes. And yet God in His brilliance and His wisdom and His sovereignty does that. He does that. And so Simon, though, just a poor fisherman, ignorant, uneducated, prideful, God broke him, used him, Christ discipled him, and the Spirit of God enabled him. 
to do what he did. And he became a pillar in the church. So there in Mark 1.16 we see, it says he saw Simon. And then it says Andrew, the brother of Simon. Andrew, the brother of Simon. Now, not as much is known about Andrew in the New Testament. In fact, not much really at all. Very little is said about this man. That does not mean that he was any less a disciple or any less an apostle of our Lord Jesus. There's just less data there. Again, this speaks to the reality that the New Testament writers selected, they were selective in the things they wrote. And so, they discerned that they were not going to write much concerning Andrew. But we know, obviously, from this text and others that he was Simon's brother. And he helped him. He, he was in the business with his brother. There is very little known from the New Testament about Andrew. But what is known is very interesting. Turn with me to John 1. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. John 1, 35 says this. Now this is at the beginning of of Jesus' earthly ministry from the perspective of John. From the perspective of John. Now we have to understand this. Just because John and Mark and Matthew may have different accounts in terms of how Jesus' ministry began does not mean they're contradictory. John just chose a different event to record, whereas Matthew and Mark chose different events, events to record. So there's certainly no contradiction. There's just variety. We get variety by the grace of God. I'm grateful that God in His brilliance caused four men to write these Gospels. So it says in verse 35 of John 1, Again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now that John, that's John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is right at the close of his ministry. Verse 36, And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, and I love this, Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 37, The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, Who do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of those who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. So we find that this is, a lot of this is built off of inference, but it's clear in the text that Andrew was a disciple of John. Was, was, he was following after John's ministry and John's teaching. And so then John comes and says, Look, the Lamb of God, the Messiah. And so then they transfer themselves from being really being John's disciples and they come under Jesus. And it says they stayed with him that whole day when they saw him. And one of those men was Andrew. Simon Peter's brothers. Interesting here, Peter wasn't here. This is Andrew. So this, this is very interesting when we consider from Andrew's perspective what he saw concerning Christ. Listen to what it says in verse 41. And he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So here we see that Andrew really was actually the first one to meet Christ uh, in terms of these two brothers and see Christ. And he actually goes and he gets Peter and brings him to Jesus. Jesus changes his name. So though Andrew has much less written about him, that does not negate his importance and negate the fact that he, like Peter, was an, a disciple and an apostle of our blessed Lord after that, after that phrase, back in Mark 1.16, it says, Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. As I said earlier, this was their occupation. This is what they did. And specifically when it says casting a net, a net in the sea, this was referencing the actual, actually the type of fishing they were doing at that moment. There was really, in, in, terms, of, in terms of the first century fishing in, in Galilee, there's three kinds of, of net fishing that was done. There was the drag net, the cast net, and then the, the trammel net. Uh, the, the drag net was just long, uh, very probably a rectangle shape. It had leads at the bottom or wood, something or something heavy, rocks to hold it down. And then um, uh, bobbers or, or wood, something that would float to hold it up at the top. And it, it would be dragged through the water. It would capture fish, obviously. 
And uh, Jesus described this process in, in Matthew, I think it was, when it talks about the end of the age, the angels are going to gather the wicked and judge them. And, that, and, that, and he used this language in talking about a trammel that are being dragged in. Excuse me. Because what they would do is they would drag the net through, and then they would capture a bunch of fish, but they could not eat the fish that did not have scales. So things like a catfish had to be thrown back. And so Jesus used that to describe how the end of the age, the, age, the angels are going to sort in terms of they're going to take the, the wicked and the righteous are going to divide us up. We're going to be meet, we're going to obviously meet Christ together with all the saints in the air, and the wicked are going to be punished. So that's one of the methods. Uh, and then there's obviously the cast net, which could be done by one person, where they would throw out, I mean, people still do this today, uh, catch bait, um, and uh, that was certainly done by, used by them as well to catch fish. You would get a lot less. And then there was the trammel net, which was more of a, uh, a complex way to do it. It was three different nets, and then one, uh, each, each time, uh, it was three nets, and then one net within each net. So a bigger net, and then a smaller net, like a medium size, and then a smaller one within that. And each one would be more and more fine the more you went down. So the, the net on the outside had large openings so fish could come in. Uh, and then the next one down had smaller openings, so, so some smaller fish could make it in. And then by the, the middle one was really, really more like a mesh, or the smallest one was more like a mesh. Very small openings. And that was so that fish would actually come in and then get stuck in the netting. And then they'd pull it out and capture the fish. But certainly here, they were using a cast net as they were on the Sea of Galilee. And actually, we know from Luke's account, something interesting happened in terms of their fishing. In Luke 5, we find this, this account. In verse 1, it says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is also um, the Sea of Galilee. It's just a different name for it. And he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake. But the two fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all day and night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled out, or they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So we see here from Luke's perspective, it's a little, bit, a little different of an account. And we find the miracle placed here. And what's even more miraculous is that in, in first century Israel, when they, would, when they would go fishing out of the Sea of Galilee, they typically did it at night because the fish would bite. They, they could catch more fish. The fish were out and about, you could say. Fishing wasn't as good during the day. And yet Jesus went out on the day, during the daytime, on the lake, and they caught this great amount of fish. And Peter was so moved by the holding of this miracle and the glory of Christ. And he said, go away from me, Lord. And that speaks to a reality that when someone encounters the living God, there is certainly this awe. When a believer encounters the living God, there's an awe about it. We see that in Scripture. But there's also this self-debasement, this self-hatred, this self-disgust. We see it in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord enthroned in glory. He sees the two angels saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. That Isaiah cried out, Woe is me. For I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. So brethren, as we grow closer to God, as we become more holy, there's going to be two things that happen. We're going to desire and yearn for God more. But also, there's this interesting dichotomy where we're also going to hate ourselves more. We're going to, we're going to grow in a self-hatred, a self-disgust. 
And there's almost a sense in which we find in our own hearts as Peter, just, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful person. I'm a sinful person. I don't want to, st- I don't want to find myself in the presence of God because I'm so sinful. So there is that sense and that dichotomy that's found there for the believer. And so Jesus manifested His miracle-working powers, His his sovereignty, His power over nature to the disciples, as He called them at the Sea of Galilee. It's also important briefly to note there that in in Luke uh, Luke 5, if you go back to Luke 4, we actually see evidence that not only did Peter and Andrew know Jesus and were acquainted with Jesus, but they probably knew Him very well before He called them to be His disciples. I, didn't, I, I was very shocked by that. I didn't realize that. I thought, this is kind of the first time Jesus ever saw these guys. I'm just like, come on, let's go. He was actually quite acquainted with them. He, he knew these guys. In fact, we know that from Luke 4 because in Luke 4 we find a record where Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He goes into her house and heals her. He knew them. They knew him. And we, even, we saw in Luke there that right when Peter met Jesus, he changed his name. And Andrew at that point was already following Jesus, and maybe not in the sense of an official disciple, an official apostle set apart, but following him just so interested, so in awe of the Lamb of God, because just as he had been following after John, when he heard John say he's the Lamb of God, he resolved to fall after Christ. So Jesus knew these men, he was acquainted with them, and they knew him. But there's, this is the official call. The official call. And this is this is very much so like an unbeliever. See, unbelievers can be acquainted with the truth of Christ. Someone can be acquainted with the gospel. Someone can know the gospel inside and out, backwards and forwards, and not be converted. Someone can be acquainted with the truth about Christ, and Christ has not called them. Someone can be follower of Christ in the sense that they're they're studying and they're seeing truth, they're seeing the truth of Scripture. And yet Christ has not called them. Christ has not brought about in His sovereignty the effectual inward call of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that before in Sunday school, but the, the effectual call of the Holy Spirit. That when the gospel goes out, that's the outward call. Right now, as I'm preaching and later on when I specifically go into discussing gospel truth, and making known gospel truth. That's the outward call of the gospel. And the inward call is what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calling the dead sinner to spiritual life in Christ. And so we kind of see that parallel here in the account of Jesus calling his disciples. That they were not set apart as his, as his disciples, capital D, and his apostles, capital A, until he called them. And so they were fishermen. They were fishermen. The least, the least of the least. They did not have a high standing in society, much money or wealth or possessions, but were simple fishermen. I love what Matthew Henry said on this uh, on this passage. He said the instruments Christ chose to employ in setting up His kingdom were the weak and foolish things of the world, not called from the great Sanhedrin or the schools of the rabbi, but picked up from among the tarpaulins by the seaside, that the excellency of the power might appear to be holy of God and not at all of them. So Jesus did that to manifest His glory and His saving grace. And then we find here in verse 17, as we continue considering the first call, this is specifically what I want to emphasize here. It says, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I, and I really like the way Jesus so brilliantly uses a play on words there. Okay, you're a fisher, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And I greatly enjoy play on words when it comes to the, uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, and on Friday night, this is this is very goofy. But on Friday night, it worked, and it was it was 
It was gospel centered and Christ exalting, so praise God. And uh, play on words are good. A guy came up to us as we were done preaching and he, uh, he had a cigarette in his hand and he said, Does anybody have a lighter? Yeah, he didn't have a lighter. He had a lighter out. Or he didn't have a lighter. He was looking for a lighter. And we said, No, no, no. And, um, and as he was walking away, I grabbed my bag. Because and, and, by this point, I put everything up, put all my tracks up. I grabbed my bag and started opening it. I said, Sir, wait, we have the light of the world. I thought, Sir, come here. And I gave him a gospel track. I said, Jesus is the light of the world. You've been born again. Ended up exhorting him, gave him a track. And anyways, so, and it was quite cheesy and quite funny in some way. But it was a play on words and it drew off of what he was saying. And it, I kind of see that here in this text from the voice of Christ and the voice of the passage here. And Jesus is playing off of what they already know to be familiar and saying, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're fishing fish, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And those first two words here, the quote, are of very much importance. Tremendous importance. Brethren, we must understand this. Follow me. Follow me. These two words indicate two things specifically. Firstly, it indicates the nature of discipleship. The nature of discipleship. The nature of discipleship is what? Is that we are following Jesus. We're not following after our own lusts. We're not following after our own feelings or our own desires. We're following after the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it also speaks secondly to the goal of discipleship or to the end. What is the end? What is the goal? To know Christ and to be known by Christ. So firstly, when we consider the nature of discipleship, we see this brought forth further in Luke chapter 9. In Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. It's important to note there in verse 23 when he says, take up your cross. The historical and cultural significance of what Jesus was saying is something that's hard for us to grasp. See, in Jesus' day, what was the form of execution that the Romans employed? Crucifixion. And it was not an easy way to die. It was a brutal death. It was a painful, torturous death. And what they would do is they would beat and they would, they would make a public mockery out of the criminal. And then they'd walk him through Jerusalem, out to Golgotha, out to the place of the goal, and then crucify him. And he would carry his cross to the city as this public spectacle. We know that from Jesus' own crucifixion. And so Jesus is saying this in Mark 9, that you have got to undergo torture and undergo agony for me and you've got to take up your cross and follow me to the place of public death and public humiliation. That is the cost of discipleship. I bet it would be astounding to find myself in that crowd as Jesus said these words. The, the gasps amongst the people. The shock that would grip them to think that such a great cost there truly is when one follows after Christ. Also later on in Luke 14, this is very convicting for us as believers. In Luke 15, Jesus said, or Luke 14, excuse me, in verse 25 it says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, Notice Jesus was not, of course he was not in any way, we know this because he was sinless, he was not in any way enamored by the crowds. He was not, he stood for truth. And so, he has these crowds, he has many people, and many of them, I mean, we're sure, were false disciples. They were just following him because it was popular, it was a great thing to do, he's doing miracles, he's feeding people. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He's saying there is an impossibility if someone loves these things more than they love me. It's impossible for them to be a disciple of myself. Verse 28, for which one of you when he wants to build a tower does not sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
And this is going along with what I said at the interruption. In verse 31, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Now, Jesus is not here saying that you actually have to sell everything and live like a hobo on the street. He's not saying that. That's not necessarily what's, what he's saying. He's saying that everything you own should be laid on the altar of sacrifice. In other words, your wife, your children, your own life, everything needs to be put on the table and all bets are off, you could say. And Jesus is Lord of my life. He's the blessed sovereign and all is his. A lot of times preachers use the phrase, make Jesus Lord of your life. And I hate that. I really do. I make Jesus Lord of your life. You don't make Jesus anything, first off. And then secondly, he never, was, he never once was not the Lord of your life. If you're an unbeliever, Jesus is Lord of your life. Jesus is Lord of your soul. Jesus is your sovereign God. You cannot resist his will. You cannot resist his sovereign decree. What the sinner needs to do is to bow the knee to the submission to, to the Lordship of Christ. That's what the sinner needs to do. They don't make Jesus anything. We don't. We need to bow the knee in submission to Christ. That's what needs to happen. If you're lost, you need to bow the knee in submission to Christ. Because He already is your Lord. So follow me. So that indicates the nature of discipleship. It's everything. We lose everything. And it's all His. And then secondly, as I said, the goal or the end of, of discipleship, what is it? It's to know Christ. To be known by Christ. It's to experience. There is a relational aspect to having, to having salvation. I don't ever want to negate that. Salvation is certainly obedient. Uh, has an aspect of obedience and holiness. And we, we are certainly... Uh, we, we go to Scripture, we read Scripture, we understand that, we pray. But all of that, what is that, what is that affecting? It's a, affecting a relationship. When someone is saved by Christ, they have a relationship with Christ. They have a relationship with Christ. So the end of discipleship is a, is a great, a, uh, the goal of discipleship is to know Christ. To know Him intimately. That's actually exactly what Paul said in the book of Philippians. In Philippians 3, he says in verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value. So he's saying everything else is valueless in comparison to the value of what? Knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that, now here's the end, I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Listen to verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. The end of discipleship is to know Christ and to be known by Him. So Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Very short, very briefly, I'll consider becoming fishers of men. This came true. This, is a, a, this is, has a prophetic aspect to it, because Jesus fulfilled that. When he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, he did that. We know, obviously, even in his own ministry, he sent them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Later on in Acts, we see in Acts 3, in Acts 2, as we saw... Um, we, we didn't consider in Acts 2.41, it says that 3,000 souls were added to their number that day after Peter's sermon. And then in Acts, uh, Acts, Acts 3, the next chapter, or excuse me, I'm sorry, in Acts 3, it is, it's, 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 it's Peter's sermon, uh, another sermon Peter preaches to the, to the Jews. And then in chapter 4, it says that the number grew to 5,000, so we have thousands upon thousands, myriads and myriads of souls coming into the kingdom. Because Jesus here in Mark said, I am going to make you fishers of men. 
Success in evangelism, success in mission, success in discipleship does not depend upon man. Does not depend upon the person who is engaging in that activity. It is the sovereign decree of God that brings about the salvation of souls. It is the word of God that we trust, brethren. Why do I go out and preach? Why do I go out and show the gospel? Why do I go to the abortion clinic? Because God has said, all of those whom He has given to Christ will be saved and none will be lost. And therefore, I trust that God will use the means, the foolishness of the message preached to bring His people to salvation. And so that is the first call. And then the first response we find in verse 18 it says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Not much to note on here, because we ourselves have already considered the nature of discipleship. So here, this text in line with what we've already read later on in Luke, this is exactly what happened. They counted the cost. They left their nets. They just dropped all that they were doing. And they looked to Christ and followed after him. I especially like the account of Matthew, when Jesus called Matthew. Because... It simply says and records that Jesus said two words. Follow me. It just says he got up and left. He was a tax collector. He was wealthy. Tax collectors made very good money in Jesus' day. Two words. There is a power. There is a power in the voice of Christ when he calls his sheep. There is a power in the inward, effectual call of the Holy Spirit when God sets someone apart for salvation. There's such a powerful call. That's why uh, in, in Calvinistic theology we call this uh, irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. Uh, that the Spirit of God, the, when salvation comes about for the elect, it cannot be resisted. It cannot. God has set the person apart. He's going to save them. And the inward call cannot be resisted. So that's the response, the first response. Thirdly, the second call in verses 19 and then the first half of verse 20. This is very brief. It says, going on a little far, a farther. So Jesus is continuing on along the shore. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So we have two other brothers now. James and John. We know James wrote, obviously, the book of James. We know John wrote five uh, books in, in Scripture. Uh, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation. So John was greatly used by God as well. We know from the book of John, he was, as, as John wrote, he said, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. So John himself had a very close and intimate relationship with Christ. We know also that John was very close with Peter. John, James, and Peter, as I said, were in this inner circle of Jesus' disciples, you could say. They were really the closest three to him. That's why in Mark 5.37, when Jesus went and healed the synagogue official, or raised, excuse me, raised the synagogue official's daughter to life, raised her from the dead, it says that he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John. Later on in Mark 9, during Jesus' transfiguration, what three disciples were who, which ones were there? Well, it says, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. So these are the men who were in Jesus' inner circle. And then it says, who were also in the boat, mending the net. So again, they're doing exactly what um, uh, Simon and Andrew were doing. And then verse 20, it says, immediately he called them. That speaks again to the power of the voice of Christ. The Greek word is dute here. It means call aloud. Yell out loud. It's just loud. It's this interjection. It's this loud, powerful call. He called them. And then it says what? And this is the fourth thing I like to consider. The second response. And they left their father, Zibdi, in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. It's important to note very briefly, as I said earlier, fishing was not really a great job. That Typically, they were poor. However, there were some who had success in it. There were some who had a good success. They probably middle class, we could maybe say, and that there was some success in their small business. They were well off. 
And it seems to be that James and John were like that. Because it says this, that they were in the boat with their father's evening. So this is a family business, and then it says, with the hired servants. So the business apparently was so good that Zebedee employed his two sons, maybe he had more sons, he had two of his sons, and then he had hired servants helping along. So this is a pretty successful boating, or excuse me, fishing business. And yet it says, and this would probably have been, you know, maybe he would have endowed this to them. Maybe their father would have endowed this unto them if they continued on in the business. But listen to this, they left their father, they left the hired servants, and they went after Christ. But this also shows us something else, that there is a responsibility in, in forsaking others for Christ. What do I mean by that? They did not leave their father hanging in the sense that it was this rude thing toward him. <coughs> because as we see that there were hired servants in the boat. So there were people there to help him. So when Jesus says you must forsake others and fall after him, he's not saying be rude to other people and be disrespectful toward other people. He's not saying that. But he's saying your allegiance to Christ should be so great that your allegiance to your spouse, your children, to anyone else is so much smaller in light of how great your allegiance to Christ is. And so they followed him, just as Simon and Andrew had followed him. And God did this in their hearts. This was all the work of God. All of it. All of it. That's why I like again what Matthew Henry said. He said that the excellency of the power might appear to be holy of God. And not at all of them. Not at all. So brethren... It is my encouragement to you, my exhortation to you, to once more this morning, to once more on the Lord's day, to count the cost of falling after Christ and to forsake all again today, to forsake all, to renew your faith in the gospel. For we are to live by faith. Habakkuk 2 4, we are the righteous is to live by faith, we're to live on it. And certainly we are to live on denying self over and over and over. What did Jesus say? You must take up your cross. What did he say? One time? Once a week? Once a month? Daily. It is a renewed action that we take upon ourselves every day to deny ourselves. So brethren, let us do that. And there is a glorious reality that comes about in our lives when we do that. When we deny ourselves, we find that that is when we are most joyful. That that is when we are living for the glory of God. God is most glorified in us when we are most forgetting about ourselves. Most forgetting about ourselves. And most fed up with ourselves and disgusted with ourselves. May God cause it to be that there is not a shred of self-confidence or a shred of pride or self-righteousness found in our hearts and in our minds. And may God, by His mercy, discipline us and, and chastise us whenever we stray. Whenever we become prideful and conceited, as Peter was. And of course, you who are lost, I encourage you to flee to Christ. To, for the first time today, to deny yourself and to take up your cross and to come after the Son of God. To come after Christ who died to save His people from their sins. And if you find yourself as someone who claims to know Christ, someone who says they know Christ, they, and they even claim, yeah, I've denied myself, but when you really look at your life and you really look at your actions, you see, no, I have not. No, I have not genuinely denied myself. I've lived for my own self and lived for my own pleasures. Then my exhortation to you is to flee. To flee your sin. To repent of this grievous evil. This, this great evil that you've done and to turn to Christ for eternal life. And so we've seen here in Mark 1, verses 16 through 20, the calling of the first disciples. That Jesus, by His own power, by His broad-shouldered strength, called these men and set them apart unto himself. 
for his own glory. This shows us the wisdom, the power of God, the divine purposes of God in doing such a thing. Because as we know from the record of the New Testament, how that worked out, how God so mightily used these men. How great is God. How glorious is God. How holy is God as well. God is so holy, so perfect in His, in his moral capacity, His moral, moral faculties. And in His holiness, He's given His law, His Ten Commandments. We know them. You've perhaps heard of them. You shall not lie or steal or blaspheme. We've trampled it underfoot. We've broken God's law. All mankind. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned. Romans 11.33 God has shut up all in disobedience. That He might have mercy on all. We all deserve hell. And we are all condemned there. If you're lost, you're condemned there. And it's hell's mouth, as it were, is opening up, ready to receive you. But in the mercy of God, in the holiness of God, in the justice of God, in the love of God toward His people, Christ came and fulfilled the law for His people and died upon the cross. Satisfying the wrath of the Father against sin. Satisfying the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God by His perfect death on the cross. And He rose again three days later. He is alive today. And death has no power. He will never die again. And after 40 days later, what happened? He ascended into glory. And He's seated there now. And as I said earlier, He is Lord over all. He is Lord over all. And the call of the Gospel is to follow after Him. And how one does that is, as we know from Mark 1.15, through repentance and belief in the Gospel. Through a, a person forsaking their sin and believing the Gospel. And when that happens, God forgives the sinner. He cleanses him of their sin. Past, present, future, all of it. They're, they're wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Father sees them as if they lived Jesus' life because he looked at Christ as if he lived their life. That is the great exchange. And I stress this every week because this is the heart of it. That Jesus takes my sin and I receive his righteousness as a gift of God. And for the glory of God. And for the one who is truly regenerate, they will bear fruit of this. They, their life, their thoughts, everything about them will reflect this glorious reality that God has given them a new heart. And this is for the child of God, our daily manna from heaven, to feed upon our daily bread, all by grace and all for the glory of God. All for His glory. We think about the glory of God, the weightiness of God's character. And we see it so beautifully put forth in the gospel. And God saving a people unto himself for his glory. So to God be the glory indeed. I would like to leave off, and I will give Peter the last word. The Apostle Peter. Quite fitting that we have considered a lot of Peter's life, and so therefore I would like to read a portion out of Peter. Specific, out of what Peter wrote. And specifically, in 2 Peter 3, verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Father, O oh God, the God of glory, I stand in awe of the truth of Scripture. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your grace. We thank You for the power of Christ's voice to call His people unto Himself. We thank you for the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that every one of us would be profoundly affected by the Word of God for believers for sanctification, for the lost for salvation. 
We praise you, O oh God, for your, your love, your grace, your mercy toward us, toward your people. And we even see it in Jesus' calling his disciples unto himself. To him be glory forever. Amen.